represent people who are indigent in Boulder when they have criminal cases against them. And specifically, we are the public defender for the city of Boulder. So anytime someone who's indigent asks for an attorney on a criminal case, we get appointed, and that also means we do all of the in-custody cases. And I've been here for 13 years um, being the public defender for the city of Boulder, and I think that's how I got hooked up in looking at some of these issues and also being involved in being asked to moderate this. So, um, and so just to be clear, I would say 70 to 80% of our clients are homeless or somewhat homeless, at times homeless. So that is my background. And I sort of thought everyone could just introduce themselves and kind of see how they're connected to this issue and then we maybe will go from there. That's great. <clears throat> Thanks, Anne. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm Stan Garnett. I uh, graduated from CU Law School in 1982. I uh, graduated undergrad from CU in 1978. I uh, grew up in Boulder. Um, went to Fairview High School, a good high school in the south part of town. Um, I uh, have been a lawyer since 1982. I was a deputy district attorney in Denver uh, for four years. I then was at uh, Denver Law Firm, Browsing Hyatt, Parker & Shrek for 22 years. I served on the school board uh, for eight years in the 90s and early 2000s, and then I was district attorney uh, for the 20th Judicial District, which is Boulder County, uh, for a little over nine years, uh, stepping down in November to go back to my law firm. I uh, am also on the board of Bridge House, um, as the, uh, which is an organization I'm very proud of. I think does a really good job of providing uh, services to the homeless community in Boulder County and also now in Aurora. Um, as district attorney, um, I was responsible for uh, prosecuting uh, state law violations, which did not include the municipal work that Ann and her folks would handle. That's all handled by the city attorney. Uh, so for example, I've never prosecuted an illegal camping case. Um, I do have some opinions on this issue and trying to find a middle ground of uh, uh, approaching the problems of homelessness in a comprehensive way and also figuring out how one enforces what those of us in the law enforcement business would call a low level public order offenses in a way that protects communities and is also fair to the people that you're prosecuting. I'm Darren O'Connor. I'm here uh, representing a number of organizations. The first is the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, who I'm a legal intern for while I'm a student at DU Law, a third year student. And I'm there, the president of the National Lawyers Guild student chapter. Um, I'm also here representing Boulder NAACP branch, as well as being a member of Boulder Rights Watch. And I'll save my comments for a moment. Good uh, evening. My name is Andrew Shoemaker. I'm, uh, I'm, I grew up south of South Boulder in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, <laughs> uh, I went to law school at University of Virginia, uh, practiced in Washington, D.C. for a while, uh, moved out here as a prosecutor for the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, and then I was uh, uh, a, an assistant U.S. attorney uh, for a little while, prosecuting white collar crime and then uh, joined a large firm based out of Washington, D.C. in the Denver area uh, called Hogan, Hogan and Hartson, now Hogan Lovers, and practiced there as a partner for a while, and then started my own firm in Boulder. And while in Boulder here, I have um, uh, served on the uh, planning board for the city of Boulder and then the city council for the city of Boulder, and was uh, uh, the mayor pro tem my last year on council, which I guess was two years ago. And um, uh, I've been involved in the homeless issues uh, quite a bit uh, on the city council level. I worked uh, um, with uh, working with uh, the shelter and the Bridge House and various uh, other organizations in terms of uh, uh, trying to achieve some solutions uh, uh, along with um, uh, I wrote an editorial at one point uh, in the camera uh, that was published in the camera about uh, the city's enforcement policy with respect to camping, um, the, the, the challenges associated with the policy and, and advocating for um, a year-round uh, campsite or, or uh, 
shelter for uh, for the homeless in the city of Oakland. Hello, my name is Mark Silverstein. I'm the legal director of the ACLU of Colorado. Um, I've been a lawyer since uh, 1989. After uh, clerking for a couple federal judges, I got a job at the ACLU in 1991, uh, and uh, uh, they uh, still let me uh, still work there after that 25, 26, 27 years. Um, I've been here at Colorado being legal director since 1996. Um, um, a lot of our cases and a lot of our effort has gone into um, uh, working on issues that involve um, how the law is uh, how the law is hurting, oppressing, or discriminating against people who are living in extreme poverty. Um, that includes challenging to laws that regulate or forbid asking for charity on public streets. Uh, it involves uh, laws that make it a crime uh, to sleep outside when you have nowhere else to go. Um, it's also um, starting to focus on when people are put in jail because they don't have money. Um, that includes what we've called the new debtor's prisons. Um, we've fought against uh, courts that issue warrants when somebody simply hasn't paid a fine that's owed to the court. Um, when courts have been uh, ordering that people uh, either pay their fine or serve so many days in jail to work off the fine, uh, we've combated that practice. And now some of the focus, again, people who are pretrial detainees and are held in jail solely because they can't afford the monetary bail that's set as a condition for their pretrial release. Uh, we're working on that issue, too. Great. So um, I think we now have the mics, too. Thank you, John. Um, can everyone hear me pretty well? Yeah. Yeah, all right. A couple people in the back now. All right, I'll try. Not usually a very quiet person, so. Um, what I wanted to start with was just maybe almost going in reverse order, but to talk about just laying the facts out about what the camping ordinance and trespass ordinance is. Um, and then maybe turning to Mark just for a few minutes to talk about the um, sort of legal challenges that have gone on, not ad nauseum, but just a little bit about that. Um, and then maybe we can start to move to sort of some of the bigger enforcement issues that um, I think everyone can be involved in. So, I just really wanted to say what the ordinance says because I think it's one of those ones that um, people sometimes don't understand what it says. And what camping, which is the one that has been challenged mostly, obviously trespass is another law that has, um, means in Boulder is that you reside or dwell temporarily in a place with shelter and conduct an activity of daily living, and that's a public space. So a park, somewhere that's owned by the public, by the public. Um, and the shelter means it's not really a tent. It's without limitation anything but clothes. And so I think that we have seen the, you know, over time the enforcement of it be folks who are sleeping with a blanket or sleeping in a sleeping bag or those types of different ways of it. Obviously there have been cases where there's been people with tents. I think that fits more people's idea of camping. Cardboard, things like that. But um, I do, that's the definition of it. And I think just to get rid of one other myth <laughs> that's out there about the camping law, which is it's not a new law in the city of Boulder. It was not created in response to the Occupy, which is sort of a myth that's out there. Um, this ordinance has been on the books for many, many years. Now it's been challenged, it's been re raised back with city council many times um, since I've been here and sort of throughout. It, but it really was not passed in response to um, the Occupy Boulder. What, what was passed in response to Occupy Boulder was closing the city parks and making those have specific hours that people could be in, and that's when we really started seeing trespass violations happen versus the traditional camping that we were seeing before that. Um, and so I wanted to kick to Mark and just kind of start legally, and then maybe we'll move more socially, if that's okay with the panel. 
Um, so Mark, maybe you could talk a little bit about the challenges that have gone on and sort of the role, or Mark, Darren, anyone can talk about the challenges that have gone on sort of legally to these types of ordinances and sort of especially in Colorado where they've ended up and <coughs> these types of. Um, sure. Um, first, I'll just tell you some developments with regards to uh, a lot of uh, a lot of very poor people are often harassed because they're asking for charity in public, um, and the laws that forbid so-called um, uh, panhandling or loitering for the purpose of begging have gone through several iterations. But uh, we have fought them in Colorado. There are organizations that have fought them around the country. And this is one area where um, there has been success in the courts because um, the courts have ruled that the act of asking for charity is, um, is expression that's protected by the First Amendment. Um, and uh, with a very good decision from the Supreme Court just a couple years ago, I think almost all panhandling laws um, in Colorado, um, uh, if they still exist, uh, no longer prohibit the pure act of asking for charity, but um, it'll be a loss such that uh, if you push somebody, uh, if you push somebody physically while asking for charity, well, that can still be made a crime because pushing somebody can be made a crime. Um, the camping issues, um, there has been, um, there has been uh, an effort to persuade the courts that laws that forbid sleeping outside um, are really laws that don't punish conduct, but they punish status. They punish the status uh, of being homeless. Uh, because if somebody has no other place to go except the outdoors, and then engages in uh, an activity that you can't help but engage in. You have to go to sleep. Um, there has been uh, this legal theory um, being developed that that's too much, that that really punishes status, and that the Eighth Amendment, um, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment, um, prohibits communities from enforcing laws that punish um, that act of sleeping outdoors. Um, the Justice Department a couple years ago um, endorsed that theory and um, presented what they call a statement of interest uh, in a pending case challenging a camping ordinance in Boise, Idaho. And the Department of Justice basically took the position that um, when the shelters are full or when someone doesn't have an alternative, punishing somebody for simply sleeping outside violates the Eighth Amendment. Um, there had, been, um, there had been a Ninth Circuit panel, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, had basically adopted that, uh, that view of the law uh, in a case challenging uh, a Los Angeles ordinance that was very broad in the way that it prohibited sleeping outside. Um, and that decision that came down was very influential but then the decision was later vacated because the parties settled. Um, and so what happened just, um, I think, early in September is that the same Boise, Idaho case that the Justice Department had weighed in on reached the Ninth Circuit again. And this time, the Ninth Circuit has issued again a precedential decision saying that it violates the, it violates the Constitution to enforce a law that punishes sleeping outdoors when someone has no place to go. And the way I read it, that covers not only uh, if the shelters are full, but it also applies to someone who can't go to a shelter, either because they've been kicked out or they've got, uh, they've got some mental health issues that prevent them, or maybe they have pets and the shelter doesn't allow pets, or there could be other reasons. But to me, the key is, you can't help it. You've got to sleep outdoors. And so to punish what, when you don't have a choice like that is what violates the Constitution. Now, we tried a couple years ago when there was a lot of controversy in Boulder about enforcement of the camping ordinance here. 
Uh, and we took a case that we thought uh, was a good set of facts to present to a court in the hope of the court adopting that view of the law. And it was somebody who had gone to a shelter in Boulder, had been turned away because they were full, and he had to sleep outside, and he had, um, I don't know if it was a sleeping bag or a blanket, but there was frost on the sleeping bag in the morning when the cop came and gave him a citation for camping. And the reason that his act of sleeping violated the camping ordinance is that because he covered himself with that blanket or that sleeping bag, if he had complied with the law and thrown away the blanket and thrown away the sleeping bag and just slept outdoors with no cover, he would have complied with the law, but probably gotten frostbite. And so we presented that, um, uh, you know, these cases are prosecuted in municipal court. So the appeal is only to the Boulder District Court, which um, uh, it did not, uh, which sustained the conviction. And we filed a petition then to have the Colorado Supreme Court look at that case. And we were one vote short in the Colorado Supreme Court about whether it would review the question of whether it was cruel and unusual punishment to uh, prosecute somebody for sleeping outside when he had no other choice. Um, we are hopeful that now we might get enough votes for the Colorado Supreme Court to look at that issue. So you run city council, and I know city council over the last few years, probably when you're sitting and right around that, looks back at these issues and was asked several times um, to relook at the issues of camping. How did that play? And obviously it's a legislative body, and um, what kind of things did you think about? And well, I mean, there's, there's so many, um, there's so many, I mean, it's, it's a political body, and there's a number of, uh, a number of factors. You have, uh, it, you know, we are a relatively progressive town, obviously, and I don't think you would find, uh, at least I can't recall, any, whether it's a city bureaucrat or a city council person who would be opposed to sheltering type issues, but but you have, um, you have the economic challenges. I mean, the city of Boulder, you watch them, they, they have issues about, um, they need a new fire station, just, just providing enough <coughs> to move the fire station. Um, police issues, you see the issues about the, the county jail. There's all these debates uh, between the city and the county about who's gonna pay for what. Um, and there's a bit of a, a brinksmanship that goes on with respect to that. Um, you've got, you've got um, citizens coming and, and, and complaining about sleeping in the, in, the, uh, in the parks in an open space and, and things like that. So you've got, you've got all these issues swirling about. Frankly, the Martin case was very helpful. Um, and uh, it, you know, whenever a court uh, provides a decision like that, it really, even though you know, we're not in the Ninth Circuit, um, Boulder's, you know, the, the city council persons were willing to sort of accept that and realize that, um, and, and argue to other citizens and whatnot that this really takes it out of politics. And that's an important thing is the, is the idea of being able to say, we don't have the discretion, we've got to do it. Um, and so that's how, well, the other thing that I, I think, you know, not just for the city of Boulder, but for, for um, bureaucrats across the country is that the way, the way these city governments work is they go, I mean, uh, in Boulder is unique. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's a small city, but it has larger city type resources, and larger city type problems, and they, they have bureaucrats that are focusing on issues. But most cities don't have those kinds of resources. And they pass policies just based on what citizen, some citizen who comes and shows up asks. And, um, and the, the, bureau, the, the city bureaucrats all go to these conferences. And now that there's a, now that there's a, a decision out there that's law uh, in the Ninth Circuit, it's finding its way in everybody's handbooks. And, every, and it's not going to, you know, the next time this issue comes up, say in Oklahoma or in Detroit, Michigan or wherever, um, you know, they, they'll, they, the city manager will have heard about it. And the city lawyer will have as well. And say, well, we don't, you know, they, they can then take that with their citizens and say, hey, we, we don't really have a choice here. Not only is this the right thing to do, but legally we're required to do it. And we really don't want to feel the lawsuit on the subject. So, so Stan, I want to kick to you a little bit. And then I'm sorry to jump you. Um, 
Zadavina, would you on the law enforcement side, but what do you think is the appropriate role of law enforcement and, um, and of sort of criminal <coughs> pieces in working with these issues? I mean, obviously these are criminal laws that have been passed and they give police certain kind of discretion and authority um, to come in the parks and do whatever, right? And obviously it's not just the homeless they're regulating with these laws. So yeah. if you can talk about kind of what you think the appropriate, especially in a progressive community like Boulder. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, I think um, there's definitely a place for laws like this. Um, you know, Andrew talked about council being political, uh, and he didn't really elaborate on what that means. Well, I'll tell you what it means. What it means is you hear from the community constantly about issues that concern them, about issues of safety for them and their families and other people that live in the community. And one of the things you hear about constantly is we don't want people sleeping and going to the bathroom in the park next to our house. Um, and that's how residents of Boulder see the issue. So the question of, is there a role for the criminal law? There probably is. These are what I call public order, low-level public order offenses, and they're pretty basic. Uh, most cities have them. They deal with urinating in public, sleeping in public, uh, being disorderly in public, that kind of thing. Um, CU students get ticketed for this kind of thing all the time. When I was in high school in Boulder, I had two friends who got ticketed for illegal camping. We all knew that you couldn't camp in the parks. You couldn't camp in open space. Everybody just knew that. You just didn't do it. Um, so there is a role for these laws. Uh, the Ninth Circuit case <clears throat> is a really interesting case. It's going to be very interesting to see whether that uh, case actually becomes settled law in the United States. The Ninth Circuit is a very liberal circuit, is my understanding. Um, and I'm not sure, maybe you know, that uh, the losing side has petitioned for an en banc hearing in that case, which yeah. means all the judges of the Ninth Circuit will decide whether they agree with that decision. And then it may, I'm sure the losing side or one of the sides may petition for search or a review. Who knows what the Tenth Circuit would do with that case? What I've said all along is I think that case is a very workable and reasonable approach to the issue because. The, the critical uh, issue in that case is, is there other sleeping facilities available in the situation? Um, in Boulder, we have lots of options for sleeping. Um, there are times when they're full, those are issues we have to address. Uh, but I think that if that ends up being the law of the United States on these issues, I think it's workable. Let me just say one last thing. <clears throat> it's something that I have been talking about for the last four or five years, and I believe very strongly, but it often doesn't, doesn't go over well in meetings like this, even though I've been a member of the ACLU for, I think, 35 years. One of the mistakes I think we make in the United States, and I've been traveling a lot uh, in other parts of the world, particularly in Latin America, one of the aspects of our culture that really fascinates other countries is our obsession with civil rights. That when we have a big problem to deal with, sometimes all we talk about is the civil rights aspects of it. And let me talk about an issue that I think is a great example of that, and that is the, the, our inability to come to terms with gun control, uh, which totally befuddles the rest of the world. Well, one of the reasons we can't do that <clears throat> is we never get past looking at the civil rights issue. And whoever takes the most extreme position about the interpretation of the Second Amendment is who win, wins the argument and says you can't pass any laws in that area. I think there's aspects of trying to figure out how to regulate uh, behavior in public spaces where we do the same thing, where we stop trying to actually solve the problem and we focus on what's actually easy, which is a civil rights analysis of the issue, and we don't look at the broader issue. So those are my thoughts on it. Darren, that's probably a perfect place for you to step in. Yeah. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts about the civil rights aspect of this, and where we go? I'm going to put it in context. First, I keep hearing that we're a very progressive city, and yet we are a city that tells people that they can't even use a blanket when they're outside at night in public, when they can't get in to shelter. Last Christmas Eve, a man named Benjamin Harvey died on the streets obeying the law. He obeyed the law. He was just in his clothes. It was 10 degrees, and he froze to death. This isn't 
uh, a one-off situation. Gentlemen in the audience tonight, I think, spoke from experience that if you even lay down a piece of cardboard underneath of you, that that too falls under the camping bed ordinance and is not allowed. Any use of anything besides clothes, uh, calling that illegal, that's not a progressive ordinance. And we didn't need to wait for the Martin case in Boise to know that that was an immoral law. Um, I've heard folks say that uh, council hears from lots of people who complain about um, homeless people in the community, especially if they're sleeping out. I heard that too, so I did an open records request. My friend Evan did the same thing to get months. I did two weeks worth of emails. Evan did more than that at times when we thought that it would be high on people's minds. Most of the emails I found in my records request were between council members and city of Denver officials talking about homelessness. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen or that people don't show up in force, but I'm here to tell you that people, I think, would definitely be okay with people wearing a blanket where we have to get rid of the progressive moniker. Now, to get off the street, to have what the Martin Court in the Ninth Circuit said was accessible overnight shelter, you have to be able to get in. There they even viewed that if there were religious aspects such that you had to go to service, that counted as being too much if that was required. Here in Boulder, we have something called coordinated entry. To get into a bed now, unless there's, we have a, a walk-up shelter, it has to be 38 degrees and precipitating, which I heard today on the radio, it will be 38 degrees and precipitating tonight. But that walk-up shelter is closed because in the morning when they checked, that wasn't the case. It was a different, uh, it was a different forecast. That's how it works. So no one on the streets tonight can walk up and get shelter. I will caveat that there's some very narrow uh, ways to pass through that. What are, we have a, a very great thing in this city. We pay someone called the court navigator. Um, and she has said about coordinated entry, so her job is to help people in the court uh, that come with, say, a camping van or a smoking ticket. And just a point of reference, who gets those tickets? 500 to 1 homeless people get the ticket for camping. Here's one, smoking. 300 to 1 homeless people get those tickets. They fail to appear, they end up in a jail. Um, our sheriff has said that roughly 35 people are in there every night um, on these non-violent municipal so Elizabeth Robinson, who's our court navigator, has said, I am a reasonably well-educated and mentally healthy person who is rested and housed and familiar with the system of social services, yet I struggle to understand it. I wonder how someone who has mental health issues, is addicted, is sleep deprived and hungry, can be expected to navigate the system. Add to that anyone who doesn't have a phone, who can't get to a computer, our, our services right now, many of them move from place to place. Fortunately, that's stopping. But you have, to, you have to be able to track that. And yet, if you fail to do so, and if tonight you can't get in because there's no lockup services, not because the services don't want to provide it, let me be clear. The shelter, the, the, the bridge house that runs the severe weather shelter where you can walk up, they would be open every night if they could. In fact, then they could employ their employees regularly instead of telling them daily whether to come or not and their volunteers. But our city decided 38 degrees of raining is a threshold or 32 degrees and dry is the threshold. So tonight, it's probably gonna be 38 and raining, but the forecast was off. Um, I think the other thing to recognize is that coordinated entry has done some good things. It has prioritized people based on vulnerability. It's prioritized them based on how long they've been here and been trying to get in. However, when the limited, limited resources to get out of homelessness continue to make people end up in these services with nowhere to go, 
what you're doing is say, we're going to take these people, we're going to give them shelter, and we're slowly going to trickle them out as fast as we can. We're giving them a bus out of town. That's our other um, plan that's bus tickets. We'll do those things. But for all the rest who can't get in and who shelter staff at coordinated entry decides gets in and does not based on their set of criteria, SOL. And you're also uh, up to crew for that. So I think to push back, not um, to push back, I think that a lot of you that we, we see here and I, is that and other communities have struggled with is our public spaces, therefore, as this population of um, people changes or either comes into different communities, are they just open to people being able to use them consistently? So can they take them over? Should um, a park just be allowed to be occupied full time by people who come into the community? And what will be the impact to other citizens of Boulder by that happening? Um, and I think that's something that I know city council, when I've been there, has weighed. And because I think it's a balance. And so what do you think, Andrew? And what do you think? I mean, Mark's over a legal guy. But I mean, what do you think? I think that's the push and pull is that if we say there's no enforcement and there's no criminal enforcement of this, I think the other side is then the parks are open for folks to stay in at all times. And the parks, therefore, are not open to other people. Or are they? And how does that balance out, do you think? A absolutely. And, and Boulder is a place where, unlike a lot of places, there is a, there is a true demand to camp uh, or sleep outside in the city of Boulder, whether you're rich or poor. I mean, you're going to have people traveling from all over the country to stay here and, and, would, uh, and would be happy to get a free place to stay uh, in, a, in a downtown park or an open space, which as many of you know, is, uh, is a real political hot button issue in the, in the city of Boulder. I do want to add as well, I, I, I'll have to tell you, I, I think those statistics you're citing are wrong. Uh, I, while I was on city council, I, I met with the municipal judge numerous times, and they track all this. My data comes from the municipal court. Well, actually, uh, your round number is in a doubt. But uh, I've seen uh, numerous statistics, and, and I've met with the municipal judge, Lisa Morzell and I did on a regular basis, and she came and made presentations to us on a quarterly basis. And she doesn't, she does not uh, sentence people to jail sentences uh, on these types of offenses. Um, and so uh, th there are, um, we can get those statistics. I don't have those are citations here, here today. But at the end of the day, um, whether it's, I mean, the question is, is someone going to jail? Or not? And the answer is no. As I recall, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but we certainly uh, uh, could get those from the municipal court. But 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 I appreciate the fact that advocates are out there making Boulder sound like a horrible place. But in terms of within the state of Colorado and nationwide, uh, Boulder's uh, Boulder's track record with actual incarceration of people for the types of things uh, that were mentioned um, is it, that's those statistics just aren't right. Well, so I've studied them, put out a DU law report, so you're welcome to an opinion, but not the facts. So let's get back to this. So let's talk a little bit more about public spaces, because I think that's really what this comes down to, is what is our obligation to, and what should a city offer? So the obligation, the criminal side, and then the ability for everyone to use and occupy and be in parks. And so not just parks, but in public spaces. Because I think that's really where the tension in the city comes down to is what is the balance? What's the appropriate way to get to the correct balance? And I think we've been talking about, I think Sam brought up the idea of civil rights as being one. That's, that may be, in, I'm going to say it wrong, <laughs> the barrier to getting to a solution. And so I guess the question I have is maybe a little more narrow focus, maybe kick it to you, Mark. Like what role do you think um, sort of civil rights, lawsuits, um, those type of pushes have to really changing and creating a solution for poor folk and for people who are struggling with these issues, and then also for communities, right? Well, I, I, I'm not going to be able to tell you that lawsuits are going to solve these problems, but I think that sometimes um, 
uh, lawsuits and the law can take some of the very harsh edges off of the uh, the relationships and the treatment of people who are impoverished and relatively powerless. So, um, talk about that a little more. What do you mean by that? Um, so, you talk about public spaces. Um, you know, people um, people who are um, I don't know. I guess to me, it's 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 pretty obvious that someone who has no home, no job, and no money is a very is very vulnerable to being uh, pushed around by law enforcement because I think what goes on is that um, uh, people seem to fear the the public sight of uh, abject poverty. Um, sometimes we hear it expressed as concern for safety. I've heard it so many times when I'm, it's being explained to me um, why, uh, why we need an ordinance that forbids homeless people from uh, asking for charity. Um, oh, it's a safety issue. Why do we need an ordinance that forbids homeless people uh, to sit on the sidewalk? Uh, it's a safety issue, I'm told. Um, why uh, in Fort Collins we're fighting on behalf of the Mennonite Church that wants to put lockers in its parking lot so that people without homes have a place to put their belongings so they don't have to carry them around with them 24-7 uh, where they're uh, subject to theft. Uh, and what do the neighbors say? Oh, it's a safety issue about the lockers. Well, I don't see what someone sitting on a sidewalk, how that is a threat to safety. I don't see how someone peacefully asking for charity is a threat to safety, or someone accessing a locker in the parking lot of the church is a threat to safety. What I think is really going on is that um, middle class people, and unfortunately people in progressive liberal communities, are afraid of people who are so poor. And they say safety, safety, but I think the people who are really in danger are often the people who are viewed as the threat to safety. They are the vulnerable populations who are subject to thefts, to assaults, and also to harassment by police officers who always want them to go somewhere else, somewhere else, so that any given public space, um, uh, homeless people have to fear that they're in the wrong public space. And when they're trying to sleep somewhere out of sight, they might be found and told, you need to wake up and you need to move on. I'll come right back. Dan, do you want to sure. respond to that? <clears throat> well, let me first say I agree with an awful lot of what Mark just said. I absolutely agree that litigation can help to provide guidance and to take the edge off some of these issues as local governments sort through how to handle them. I also believe <laughs> and agree that having law enforcement focus on people who are homeless or who are poor is completely inappropriate and is something that needs to be addressed if it happens. On the other hand, I want you to think for me for a minute, let's imagine we're not talking about homelessness and people who are homeless. Let's imagine we're talking about CU students. My uh, yeah, grandparents' house was at 13th and Euclid, right across from Beach Park. A lot of you probably know where Beach Park is. It's a great park. <clears throat> we hear from, in law enforcement, we heard from people all the time about the problems of CU students, particularly on Friday and Saturday night, particularly after they had too much to drink, misbehaving, uh, urinating in the streets, uh, etc. And many of these laws that we're talking about, low-level public order offenses, resulted in tickets to CU students for these kinds of offenses. I can tell you that people from just my interaction and you know this idea, uh, Darren, and I don't, I don't know your statistics on the others, but the idea that the community doesn't get in touch with its law enforcement people and its city representatives about issues like people sleeping in the park is just not true. It happens all the time. I heard about it all the time as district attorney, and these were not my laws to enforce. So the community does care about this, and I also believe that fundamental to the idea of a civilization and fundamental to the idea of a city, going back to the days of the Greeks and the Romans, is that you have to have rules 
about where people sleep and where they go to the bathroom. That's just the way it works. That's civilization. And so the idea that we don't have any rules and that can, people can do whatever they want would be a very difficult situation. And I can tell you, Andrew's right. If people heard that they could come and just pitch a tent in any park in the city of Boulder anytime they wanted and there was no consequence, you would see, particularly in the nice months of the year, lots and lots of people doing that um, just because they wanted to do it. It would be very offensive to the community. So how you sort this out, I don't know. I mean, I floated in an email between the four of us a couple of weeks ago the possibility of having an affirmative defense to enforcement of some of these low-level laws that, in fact, somebody is homeless. That, in other words, if you got a ticket for camping and you could meet certain requirements establishing that you didn't have other resources, et cetera, that would be a defense. That may, that may not, you know, that may or may not be workable. What I'm saying about the, the civil rights issue, and I want to make sure it's clear, obviously civil rights issues are very important. They're important in any country, particularly in ours, given our tradition in the Bill of Rights. But it's only the very beginning. Anybody that travels knows every city in the country is struggling with these issues. I was in Los Angeles not long ago, um, and I was meeting with the district attorney in Los Angeles, Jackie Lacey, who's a wonderful person and good friend of mine. Los Angeles has pretty much given up trying to regulate homelessness in certain blocks in downtown Los Angeles. And it has resulted in rampant crime, rampant crime against the homeless primarily. And it's, it's not a solution uh, to this. So these are issues every community in the United States deals with this. I've asked many times, give me an example of another community that's figured this out, and I haven't heard one. I've heard Eugene, Oregon on occasion, but if you talk to the people that handle the enforcement of these laws there, they'll say it's very difficult there as well. We need to get it right. Maybe we're progressive, maybe we're not. I think Boulder's a great community. I think it has a great heart. I think people care a lot. The uh, solutions are not simple, and they're more than simply civil rights violations that we have to try to figure out. We have to try to figure out how to get people out of homelessness, but we cannot give up on the idea that having a city, having a community, having a civilization means that we have basic rules, basic rules about how we all behave to protect the rights of everyone. Andrew, I know you wanted to jump in, please. Sure, and I, Stan said a lot of what I did, but I, but I want to add as well, I think that, you know, with all due respect, the idea that, that this is just a, um, you know, middle class America, which there's not much of anymore, um, is that looking at, uh, looking at a homeless person and, uh, and just not liking them, and that's the reason uh, for, uh, for these laws, and that's just... That's, that's oversimplification of the issue. And I, see, I see a lot of that in modern politics. And it, it's, it's not that clean. As, as Stan said, there are, um, there, the citizens do care about these issues, and there are health and safety issues. It's not like there's a person sitting on, on, uh, on the park and, and not doing anything, and that's that. And we, I mean, a lot, of the a lot of the information we hear from parents of children, from, uh, from uh, at Boulder High, uh, uh, the, the issues that arise there, uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the um, piles of needles in the creek, um, uh, human refuse, uh, all the th you know, things that are associated with living in a location and spending the night there and, and just doing your bodily functions. That alone, um, I mean, Boulder Creek is a mess. Uh, and so there are reasons that you have rules about where people can and can't um, spend the night, and the issue is, of course, you know, providing a place where that can occur and providing uh, a, a safe and sanitary situation so that not only is it it's safe and sanitary for the rest, but as Stan said, it also prevents um, victimization of the homeless as well. Because when you've got people sleeping um, out in, in the dark and uh, in, in hiding under a bridge or whatever, um, we've got, you know, th th that, that's prime opportunity for, for bad things to happen to, to those people as well, so. Aaron, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I think, you know, in, in some area of agreement, in a civilized nation, we have places for people to sleep. We do not. We have had ugly laws when we tell people um, if they're disabled, they can't access um, certain parts of, of our civilization. We've had, um, sundown laws that tell African Americans they have to leave 
What this law does in Boulder is not civilized. What it does is says if you're homeless, you have to hide. Now, Anne framed the question uh, in terms of what would happen, what would it look like if we opened up the parks and allowed people to sleep. That is not the only solution. Um, in Eugene, which I traveled to uh, with Andrew, um, who didn't come to see the camps or the tiny homes, he took another tour, fair enough. But what we saw there was sanctioned camps and tiny homes, villages of 42 homes organized and run by the people who lived there, formerly homeless, who all they had to do was have a plan for how they would get out of living in that tiny home and move on back to some semblance of normalcy. But I'll tell you, it looked pretty normal seeing these people in a civilized space set aside for them. We don't do that. We don't do that. We don't have a restroom facility. That is, yeah. So last year, sir, um, a group of people, um, friends of Boulder Creek started up, and they were worried about this issue of refuse around the creek. Council heard from people like myself saying, let's get some bathrooms. They heard from these people saying, we've got to clean the creek. The first choice was to spend hundreds of thousand dollars on cleanup and mitigation instead of putting bathrooms up. It was, it was like twisting arms to get porta potties put up at an incredibly reasonable price because there's, there's some sort of belief that we're making it too easy to be homeless. I don't know about you, I, I've only slept out one night in Boulder in just my clothes. It was about 50 degrees and I froze my butt off. And I had to walk around and around to find one of those porta potties Because there were only about, I don't, I don't know, they, they weren't very frequently placed. But That's only French too. Right. So before that, there was the one on Pearl Street Mall. Closes at like 11. They closed it earlier after this issue came up. You can play Sharpie, you can have Sharpie boxes in those. Now certainly not everyone's going to use them, but do we set policy around the people who don't behave and tell all the rest who are a much greater number, sorry you don't get to go to the bathroom, sorry you can't use a blanket because these people are behaving badly. We can have sanctioned areas, we can do it like other cities have done it, Eugene has done some good things. They're still enforcing their camping ban in violation of the, uh, of the Martin case to this day. But they're also doing some good things. Boulder has some shelter. But 2016, we had 4,884 people who came through the different service agencies in a year. We currently have 210 beds. So can I? Um, I know you wanted to jump in, but I, I would throw it out to folks. Um, it's very compassionate for cities to pay for this, but are cities required to? I mean, if a city said, we don't want to pay for that, we want to pay for, I don't know, anything millions else. to put people in jail. Right, and mm -hmm. I'm not saying that, so maybe uh, that's the balance. Millions. So, if, um, so you wanted to jump in. Uh, what I was going to say, the whole bathroom issue is really a conundrum. Uh, I was in Seattle not long ago, the DA, the DA up there is a terrific guy, very progressive, I think even Darren would agree. Um, he, and, and they've had huge, and homelessness is a huge problem in Seattle. They have a permanent homeless population of between four and 5,000, mainly who live in downtown Seattle. They provided permanent bathrooms uh, that were built uh, to, to be available 24-7 and they had so much problems with criminality, with sex assaults happening, with drug dealing happening, with assaults happening, that they had to close them. I mean, these issues are not simple. This is, and this is my whole point. The whole issue of how do we approach this is very, very complex. There is no simple solution. You know, the debate about bathrooms along the creek was focused on what exactly is gonna happen and how are we gonna make sure these are safe places because they ended up not being safe places for the people that use them and for the people that want to prey on other people. So the issues are complicated. They're not simple. It's again why I, I, I push back on saying it's just a civil rights issue. It's more than that. We have to look at that and uh, all the different aspects. Mark. I, I just, 
you know, um, so bathrooms are put up in Seattle, and then there's crime associated with the bathrooms. And so it seems like then there's a policy choice. Do you do something to fight crime in those places? Do you uh, put more police officers there to protect the safety of the people who want to use the bathrooms for their intended purpose? Or do you shut them down? And uh, I don't know how much uh, they considered the option of actually trying to do more to protect well, the people. Uh, how about engineering the facilities to be discouraging the type of behavior? This is a common engineering practice, not difficult. So, yeah. 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 Sure. Does anyone want to have a question or a comment or something? Back? Yeah, um, I just want to ask, mostly you see Stan and, I don't know, the gentleman who's on the state council. Andrew. Andrew, okay. So, um, currently, Boulder obviously has a campaign law where you can't link it, otherwise it's a secure campaign, but then another section of the government also gives out linking. So, how do you reconcile the fact that you're literally giving people, which I'm sure is a good intention, action, people blankets to survive at night, but basically inviting them to get a citation for camping. Yeah, they don't give us a disclaimer to use it in the daytime only. <laughs> is that the city government or is that volunteer services? That, that I Boulder suspect cares. it's the latter. Boulder Cares. Boulder Cares. Yeah. So that's don't worry if they case. stop doing that. Boulder County Cares no longer gives out. No more care. Okay. <laughs> Problem solved. The city shelters do. Yeah, well, they serve but I, I, I would add as well, I mean, you can go on the, um, uh, the, you know, if you go on the city's website now and you look at um, the homelessness section, there is a dash, what they call the dashboard. And you can, you can see that, um, and it's, it, it's, it's fascinating in terms of the graphs to show the fact of, of the sort of the lack of shelter uh, being full, both um, with and without inclement weather. And you can see the number of beds that increased. During Let's be clear, you have to get into coordinated entry to get to those beds. Okay. And they're turning people away. Well, if, you know, that's... Well, the international so travelers... Hang on, Stephen. There's another person who has a question. No, I had, I had oh, response. go ahead. Go ahead, respond to I think it's a great point about the blankets. I think it illustrates an issue that has bothered me for a long time, which is the lack of coordinated um, handling of the issue within Boulder County. One of the things that concerns me is that as many things that we do in Boulder, um, we have a lot of people that care a lot, but it's very disparate how we approach it. Um, and we don't organize it, and we're not consistent in what our messaging is, so I think it's a fair point. Yeah. Okay, um, I just want to address some of the issues that came up. Uh, I'm a missionary, and I was, tra I was traveling in Meridian, Mississippi, and they were using abandoned buildings uh, they were using those, uh, opening those buildings up for homeless people. And I've been happy to, to do some research on that for you because it, it seems the peer to go is working very well uh, instead of trying to push them out <coughs> to try to help them. And uh, uh, as I've worked with homeless people, uh, I've been to the park in Denver and I've had people, we've had people come and be our security who are homeless. So I, I think a lot of, um, I think there's some misconceptions also about homeless and I think uh, there, there needs to be ways to where we can get a better understanding of, of what's happening with homeless people. They're, they're different just like we are, you know. Uh, some are good, some are bad, so forth and so on. And also, Darren was mentioning com computers, not the use of computers. I was at the, I was, trying, I was looking for a job and I helped people find a job and I went to uh, the Longmont City Council building, I think it was, it was. And they don't, they don't even have paper applications. And I felt like that was discrimination because if you don't have a computer, you know, you don't have a computer, you need some paper so you can fill your application out. So what the lady told me is go to the library and they will they will help them with that. But some people don't even know how to use a computer. So uh, I feel like that's a civil rights issue also. And uh, instead of using the, with the bathrooms, instead of using the police, the police are, are sounds like police are, some of the police are, Using a lot, a lot of their time with the citations and et cetera, et cetera. If they if they have that much time to do citations, <coughs> maybe they could be there for security for the bathrooms, walk around, you know, here. Yeah. So maybe we could turn to a quick discussion about solutions. Andrew, I know you've written a little bit about ideas. 
that when people show up for their camping ticket, that jail is not on the table for them. I think where you start to see the disparities is the difficulty with homeless folks is sometimes also coming to court. And so when people fail to appear, that's when they get arrested on the warrant, and then they go to jail, and then the only offer when you go to jail, when you've been arrested on those tickets, is jail. It's no longer an option to go through the alternative. So I, to defend Boulder Municipal Court and also to criticize, I think, the defending piece is that with, when you show up, there are a lot of services through Municipal Court. Elizabeth Robinson is the navigator that's hired by the city of Boulder to help folks find permanent housing. Um, there's community service that's always suspended if you just work on some of your housing issues. So in terms of showing up, I think the struggle really is when the issues start to complicate, which is a person doesn't show up on their criminal charge for a lot of the same reasons, potentially, that they have ended up homeless. Um, and then they get arrested, and then you are actually seeing, seeing fairly significant sentences. I mean, we had a, often they had a case for 98, which is, I think, you know, not just on camping, on camping and trespass, but it's the repeated behavior that I think starts to befuddle people when it ends up in the criminal justice system. Because it stops sometimes being just the action, it's the action over and over and over and over again in the same spot, and then it becomes, kind of grows into something else when you have criminal justice involved, or criminal systems, versus just, the truth is when they come to court, and the statistics are right, so you're both right, <laughs> in the sense that, when folks show up, there are a lot of alternatives. They use a different form of, not necessarily restorative justice, but a different form of system. It's just when people don't show up for courts. I don't know if that helps in that kind of thing. I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in. The gentleman in the green striped shirt had a question. Yeah, actually, I'm sorry, I didn't actually have a question. Oh, I was just never mind. There. I was having a hard time hearing Andrew. Oh, I'm sorry. But now that you have, now that I care, um, I have noticed that just not a whole lot of comments on mental health. Uh, issues um, and a lot of the criminality obviously that surrounds things like the bathroom and things, you know, stuff like if someone could speak maybe about, you know, diversionary, you know, sort of techniques as opposed to jail, you know, and how we can deal uh, with a lot of these behaviors through the mental health system. There's a pre trial diversion program for mental health that's just being implemented. It hasn't started yet, but they, they got some millions of dollars at the federal level and some at the state level. Our Sheriff Joe Kelly was on the mental health um, group at, at the governor's office working on policy. They got a pot of money. So in Boulder now, there's going to be a pretrial diversion program. There was a, an article about that about a week ago, an announcement. But that's gonna mean if you have nonviolent offenses and you present with mental health issues and you volunteer to go through it, you, you won't go through court, you'll go through getting mental health assistance. Well, a lot of times it's cheaper than jail, you know, and I think that that needs to, that needs to be said. We've actually had the PACE program in place for several years, which is um, a really terrific program that permits the arresting officer without any contact with the district attorney or with the courts uh, to make a decision that mental health diversion is appropriate. So the new program that Darren's referring to, I think is terrific and, it, and I think has a lot of promise, but we've already been doing a lot of diversion of mental health issues. But mental health is a real challenge. Um, it's an issue throughout the criminal justice system and our resources in the state of Colorado are very limited and it's, and it's unfortunate. You know, none of this should make us feel comfortable with what's gonna be available, because right now we have very little. I'm glad there was a space program, but it's been limited, very limited. That tiny mental health issue, mm -hmm. we have a couple of consistent officers who are proud of their ticket ranks, who disclose in their normal interaction with the indigent population that they have untreated psychiatric disorders and are we excusing or threatening or in some way intimidating them on American Disability Act threats they attempt to throw off those type of federal charges for calling officers on their fabrication of fictional circumstances in their jumping to conclusions and my ticket rates. So there's someone else, can you? Rob. Oh, in the I'm not sure. How about you go? Rob, you uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. <coughs> I, I'm, uh, I just wanna make a comment uh, about the <coughs> distinction to say civil rights are too much of a focus. We've 
in American law, the tradition we inherited uh, is very much filled with ideological divides. And in American law, property is more important than people. And we look at how it has embedded in it historic laws like the doctrine of discovery. So that even in the 20th century, we successfully voided all treaties with Native Americans. But the law did not protect individuals with whom we made unending, duplicitous <coughs> treaties. And we still justify moving them out of areas that we want. We've done the same thing with poverty, criminalizing it, and thinking of people who are poor as immoral, as having failed the fundamental test <coughs> of the right of to be considered an American. That distinction you talked about your friend in Los, uh, in, in Los Angeles. I heard the other day something that astonished me. Not only is there a homeless problem, but on any given day, supposedly, someone's counted these things, there are 16,000 people living in their cars. That's not far removed. Sure, that's right. From yeah. It's homeless. consistent with what I've heard. And so the economic divide that has grown in our country is one of the conditions of poverty. It's not a condition that people have brought upon themselves. And when I was a, a selectman in a town in Maine a few years ago, I got every year mandates from the state and the federal government which made it very clear that we were responsible for all of the people who came into our purview. We didn't have a town big enough to have a dog catcher. The highest elected official was the dog catcher. And that went on down the list. Every year we got new mandates so that it became, if no one else was available to be the uh, the emergency defense coordinator, highest elected official became the emergency defense coordinator. If there was no one around to be the poverty person to provide welfare, food, and housing, the highest elected official had that responsibility. You could not push people out of your community who came to you in need. And that's the game that we play in Boulder and many other cities in this country. By simply not seeing a need to make a legal and safe place for people who are homeless to sleep at night when there's not adequate shelter, we are failing to be responsible for the people in our purview if we are elected officials. That it's too easy to say, gee, there's no room. It, when it's clearly possible to create space and to provide facilities that are safe, well lit, and attended, not necessarily by a police person, by an attendant who is welcoming and caring and helps keep the place orderly. So we can enlarge our yeah. conversation, get beyond, gee, it's just not our problem. Yeah. We'll take a well, vote for um, the manager now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it is time to set. I need to go 5.30 to 6.30, and I know for myself, I have a child at home I have to get home to. So I apologize. Um, but thank you all. You're welcome to stay around and have more of a conversation to this. And talk about the first part. Thank you.